This, this is Dallas this. Cowboys Crosstalk. Crosstalk. Check this out. Live from the Cowboys Club at the Star in Frisco. Brought to you by A Number One Air, the official HVAC and electric partner of the Dallas Cowboys. Blockchain.com. Make your crypto play today. The National Medal of Honor Museum. Join the mission at mohmuseum.org. Buffalo Wild Wings. And by SWBC Mortgage. Customized solutions to help you meet your personal and business goals. Visit swbc.com. Welcome to Cowboys Crosstalk. We are live from the Cowboys Club at the Star in Frisco. I'm Bobby Belt from 105.3 The Fan. We've got proud Missouri Tiger. That's uh, right. Mickey Spagnola from DallasCowboys.com. Of course, joined by three-time Super Bowl champion and six-time Pro Bowler Nate Newton. Yeah! And our Cowboys yeah. legend this evening, our, our other Cowboys legend this evening, is former first-round pick, two-time Super Bowl champion, pass-rushing extraordinaire, Jim Jeffcoat. Jimmy Jim Jeffcoat, baby! Yes, sir! What's up? What's up? You. Since, since sacks were a statistic that was tracked starting in 1982, only Demarcus Ware has more seasons of 10 sacks for the Dallas Cowboys wow. than Jim Jeffcoat. So wow. high, high company there. All right, so the Cowboys are coming off of a big victory at AT&T Stadium last Thursday. They beat the Seahawks 41-35, to a game that was a little more, uh, you know, high-powered, a, a, yes. a bigger shootout than I think a lot of people had expected. Uh, Jim, you know, I know we were talking before the show here about some of the stuff with the defense and, and some of the takeaways you had from that. What were your big impressions coming out of this game against the Seahawks? My big impressions of them was that they have three wide receivers that can beat you at Seattle. And you saw that. I mean, D.K. Metcalf, we all know about him. Smith, the uh, kid from Ohio. And they, they have players, people who shouldn't be shocked. And they can uh, isolate you. What the Cowboys did well, though, is they moved Gilmore over to Metcalf, and that helped them. And they let Bland does what Bland does, get picks. Yes. <laughs> Came up with another interception, yeah. almost had a second in that yes, game. He, yes. Of course, uh, we, we got Pro Bowl voting today. He is leading the NFC in Pro Bowl voting at quarterback. Or at quarterback. And so uh, Deron Bland absolutely contributed in a big way. Nate, what were uh, some of your big takeaways coming out of this game? I just like how Dak continued to uh, perform, how him and the offensive line and the running backs are uh, doing a tremendous job of trying to keep Dak upright because I believe when you have a passing game, it's just not just the offensive line doing his job. It's about the backs picking up the blitzes and picking up guys that are leaking and your quarterback using his legs just enough to stay in the clear to give his receivers a chance to get open. So that really uh, impressed me. And then I liked the three stops by the defense yeah. in the fourth quarter to make sure we seal the faith of those guys. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Mickey, you know, we just talked there about Dak Prescott and the way that he's playing right now. I, I think at this point we all agree this is as good as we've seen Dak Prescott play over a six, seven-week stretch probably of his career. Uh, is this one of the better runs you think we've seen from a Cowboys quarterback? I think it's one of his better runs for sure. I'm sure Tony Romo had some runs that, you know, it's so long ago people forget. Actually, it's so long ago people forget that Dak Prescott, uh, his rookie year, won 11 straight games after the opening season opening loss. So he's had some pretty good stretches. But for this year, I was just looking at the stat between – what he did the first five games and what he's done the last seven games. And his quarterback rating in those first five games was 87. And in the last seven games, it's 121. Man. So he, it just kind of an indication of the efficiency he's been playing with, uh, leading the league with 26 touchdowns right now, 21 of those coming in these last seven games. So he's playing at a high level, but... Nate, I, I'm, you may appreciate this. Uh, I think a lot of this has to do with the offensive line coming together uh, with some continuity and doing a better job, not only in pass protection. Uh, and by the way, I know he got sacked four times, but two of those were on blitzes the running back didn't pick up. Uh, but also the running game has picked up also. And the common denominator is the offensive line playing better. Uh, yes, and I think... In when I, when, I, when I look at this thing, I, I see a combination of Coach uh, Mike Slard, the offensive line coach, and Coach uh, 
McCarthy is being very creative in what they're doing, and they're using Tony Wright, you know, outside of the tackles, into, into the screen game, into the pass game, getting a little quick hitters. The same way we started the season trying to make sure the quarterback get the ball out of his hand, we're trying to make sure Tony can get a, a fast start and doing the things that they can do. And like I say, this offensive line is not as good as what we've had in the past individually, but as a unit, they're playing well, and they are helping them as a team to be better. What's interesting about that is that the McCartney coach teams in Green Bay, when they went to the Super Bowl, they led the NFL yeah. in offense, and the year after they led the NFL in offense, and right now they're doing that, so that helps them. Jim, you know, when we talk about the way the defense played in this game, and there, and there were some struggles certainly uh, early on in this game. You know, Cowboys get up by 10, and then there's a, a run there where Seattle outscores the Cowboys 28 to 10. And, uh, you know, Geno Smith and that passing attack were putting a lot of pressure on them. But when it mattered, the defense really stepped up. You got the exactly. big stop from Demarcus Lawrence. You know, even though they started the game, I believe, 8 of 9 on third down conversions, the defense came through when it mattered most. What does that say about the character and the makeup of this defense that, hey, even though there was all this working against them and, and may have been depleting them, that they bounced back, and when those three opportunities presented themselves, they got them off the field? There's no question about it. When you can do that, that helps you build your confidence, which they should have confidence because they've been playing well all year. And you're going to hit a bump in the road, but they didn't let that stop them. They started getting better, and as the game progressed in the fourth quarter, uh, fourth down, when you can stop them on fourth down, that's like a takeaway, yeah. and that's what they did. And so those things are good, and that's going to help them because they have a, a tough teams. They got uh, this team, Philly. They got Buffalo. They got Miami and Detroit. So they're going to have to play at that level because they're playing some of the better teams in the NFL. Yeah, this is absolutely a difficult stretch run for them. One of the things that was interesting in the locker room after the game was a lot of the guys were talking about – you know, uh, Tony Pollard, Jake Ferguson, they mentioned that they were like, man, this defense has saved us so many times and, and bailed us out at different points over the last couple of years. It was nice to kind of give them a boost a little bit and pick them up. Is that something that whenever you had a, a game like that, if the defense had a game where, you know, man, the offense is really bailing us out, did it make you feel a little vindicated? Like, all right, we're, we're even. We, we got you guys at the end. We, we made sure to get that stop when you needed it. So we're good. We're even. Anytime you play Barry Sanders, the, the offense had to bail us out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. And every time we played the Eagles, y'all had to right. bail us out. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That, that's exactly what it is. Now, Nate, you know, Mickey had just uh, talked to you about it. The, the improvements that we've seen in Tony Pollard are probably directly reflected in the improvements we've seen on the offensive line. Terrence Steele has played better in recent weeks. I think Tyler Biotish has had some better games in recent weeks. How important is that? I think a lot of people just look at it as, well, Well, let me get the, the best five. We talk about the best five and everything else like that. But how important is that unit cohesion and, and that time spent on task to, to take it from the first game they had all played together finally after a year and a half against San Francisco in week five to where they've come today? How much of the improvement is just about gelling together? That's what it's all about. You know, I, I've – bickered with people give me your best five give me your best five or what is your best five ain't played more than two games together they, you know the left tackle out the right guard out now you're center out you never get no continuity you get five guys that's willing to work hard willing to study the film that'll give you your best chance to win because now you can start scheming things now they've had uh, uh what eight games where they've all played together yep. uh, they've given tyron smith time off during the week to make sure mm -hmm. she he's ready for the game so now that continuity i i would say it over and over this line is nowhere near what it was four years ago but what they are is playing together that we've in the last four years we've not had an offensive line you go back and check the statistics mick we know how the offensive line played together five guys more than six games over a stretch period of time. So even though they may not be as good individually, they're playing great as a unit, and the coach understands what needs to be done. So what have you seen maybe a difference uh, from Terrence Steele? Because, by the way, it was Philadelphia when he struggled, especially yeah. against H Hassan Reddick, right? Well, a lot yeah. of people and Reddick struggled, yeah. struggled <laughs> right? He's pretty yeah. good. He's pretty and yeah. you yeah. know they're going to put him over Steele again. So yeah. Well, he's at 9.5 sacks right now, uh, Hassan Reddick. But the thing is, if, if you can run the ball just enough to keep his confidence, Steele is a handsy guy. He likes to put his hands on you. 
So Jeff Coat, no, if you get a guy like myself who like to put it, if I'm lunging, if I'm all out of character, if I'm not stable, that it's over because he's too quick. He's going to move. He's going to bat. He's going to do whatever it takes because he know I'm lunging. Still, that was his problem. Even though he hasn't gotten back to the guy we knew a year ago before the injury, he's gotten better because he's getting patient. He's letting the guy come to him, and he's, he's taking the fight from that point. So his angles of impact is better. His, his slide step is better. But I still think you have to every now and then give him a little help. Every now and then give him a nudge. And he run just enough to uh, offset uh, Hassan just having a free reign. Now, you know, when we look at this defense, Jim, you know, there was a lot of talk this week about the Shaq Leonard situation and were, were they going to be able to, to pick up a linebacker. He ultimately signs with Philadelphia. He'll be at AT&T Stadium, I imagine, this weekend, uh, ju just not for the Cowboys. But do you think that what we've seen in the last couple of weeks should, should make the Cowboys feel a little bit more comfortable about their run defense and say that, hey, we're, we're in a better position. We're starting to come together. Marquise Bell has been a revelation for them playing as, as sort of a hybrid player. Damone Clark seems to be coming along. Do you think that that's, that, that at least feels like less of, a, of something that you lost out on than it would have maybe a month ago? Well, you'd like to have a guy like that who um, has success in the league, but you don't have him, and you have been playing well. It wasn't um, – they didn't have issues because of the Damone Clark or um, Bell. Mar Marquise Bell. They didn't have issues because of that. And Philly's going to try to run. Where are they – where they're going to try to run is off tackle. We know they're going to go off tackle. Yeah. And they'll be prepared for it, I think, and those guys will play well. Um, they won't be able to run in the interior because Smith and some of the, um, the other – is it John Hanks? Hankins yeah. are pretty stout inside. They're going to try to go off tackle and try to make some – and I think Swift's a little banged up anyway, so – uh, yeah, he this, took uh, a pounding. Yeah, he this did last take a game, pounding. boy. Oh, so Sanford, my God. San Francisco got yeah. after yeah. him, right? Yeah. So they're going to try that, but that doesn't mean they're going to be successful at it. And that's where they're going to try to attack you at. When teams track, they can't attack the Cowboys between the tackles. They try to attack them, attack them off tackle. So that's what they'll try, but they won't have success with that because they'll be prepared for it. Just before we go to break here, uh, Mickey, when we look at the – this game, it feels like, meant something from the perspective of there was a lot of a national narrative that said the Cowboys haven't beaten anybody, you know, with, with a winning record. Seattle had that. And they say, well, the Cowboys have either beaten people up or when it came down to close, tight games, they've lost on in, in those moments. This has seemed to answer two big questions for them right there, and that would, you'd think, be a big confidence builder for what's going to be a stretch of really tough games. Yeah, I, absolutely. And, you know, uh, I thought what they did against Seattle – and I know Seattle came in, okay, they were 6-5. and five. They weren't a great team, but they did have a winning record. Uh, and I thought the key thing was they found a way to win. And, you know, if you think about it, everybody's been patting Philadelphia on the back because they had a couple games in a row there before San Francisco beat them. They didn't play very well, yeah. but they got credit for finding a way to win, and that's what the Cowboys did, and that should give them some confidence going forward that if you hang in there, hang in there, you never know after, you know, what uh, Seattle scored on six of eight possessions, and yep. one of them was a missed field goal that they didn't, and they came up with the plays to make down the stretch on those three uh, possessions, right? All four of them stops on fourth down, if you remember it. And, Jim, you you had to come off your seat when you saw Demarcus Lawrence on fourth and one yes. make that stop, yes, right? Yes, that was impressive right there. He's still playing at a high level, and it's very impressive that uh, Demarcus can do that. And he's, uh, you know, he's the leader of that defense, and he's showing it because you got to make plays in those crucial situations if you want to win. And that's going to help you, like you said, going forward. When we come back, two of the Cowboys' biggest threats in the NFC squared off this past weekend. We'll talk about what we've learned about the 49ers and the Eagles in relation to the Cowboys. That's next on the SWBC Mortgage Cowboys Crosstalk.
Back, back to back, Dallas back, Cowboys back. Crosstalk. Yeah, check this out. Live from the Cowboys Club at the Star in Frisco. We are back on Cowboys Crosstalk. We've got Mickey Spagnola from DallasCowboys.com and Cowboys legends Nate Newton and our special guest tonight, Jim Jeffco. Jim Jeffco. So we've got a uh, – we'll, we'll talk here in a second about the Eagles coming to town. Uh, you know, they, they – come into town as the best record in the NFC still. They're coming off of a, a pretty brutal loss at the hands of the 49ers, though. But before we get into that, I know Mickey had just asked you before we went to break about Demarcus Lawrence and the big play he made there. And it's felt like at times Demarcus Lawrence has gone pretty underappreciated uh, by, by analysts or, or, or fans or whoever else. And that they go, well, he doesn't quite get, you know, the, those 14 sack seasons anymore like he had five or six years ago. But the, the biggest thing about him is he is such a complete defensive end. And, and, you know, you see that big play he makes on fourth and two. Just talk a little bit about, you know, the value that Demarcus Lawrence brings to a defense and how it goes past just sack numbers. Well, first of all, he's healthy, and that's big. And he doesn't have a, if you remember last year, he had issues with his foot. Now he's healthy, and uh, he goes in there, and he plays a lot of uh, rundowns. He's not playing as many pass downs as he was in the past. He's playing, they're giving him a spell and letting him, because they know that he can play the run very well, which he is, which he is. And he's doing some things that he's helping them, just like in the past when the Cowboys were really good, they had roles for players. His role is more to uh, be strong against the run as opposed to being a pass rusher, and he's doing that. Now when he gets the opportunity to rush the passer, he's going to take it, obviously, and take that and run with it. But most of the time, you see his big plays coming in the running game. Hey, one other question for you real quick, but just before we go back to, uh, you know, the, this 49ers-Eagles matchup and what that means for the Cowboys, another guy that's gotten a lot of talk about, like, well, where's the sack production and how he's playing is their first-round pick this year, Mozzie Smith, and a guy who plays nose tackle. Is it a better reflection or, or a better understanding of guys like Mozzie Smith and Jonathan Hankins of, hey, you're, you're not necessarily going to notice them from splash plays. What you're going to notice is when the linebackers are playing better, that's probably a pretty good indication that these guys are doing their jobs because they're keeping them clean. That's exactly right. You don't anticipate them uh, making a lot of splash plays because of the positions they play. But Mozzie Smith has been getting better all year, and Hankins is steady. And like I said, People don't run in the middle of the Cowboys right now because they got two big guys there that are controlling those guards in the center, and that's what they do well. They force you to have to attack them on the perimeter. Well, two teams that like to run the ball quite a bit are the 49ers and the Eagles, and they squared off in a game that you know, had a lot of chatter about it, just like Dallas's matchup with them in Week 5 did. And this was a game that felt like it set up really good for Philadelphia and, and these two Titans and, and, and the way they matched up. And, and Dallas, you know, watching probably with some interest to see how it affects them and their seating. But it felt like a game that was going to set up nice for Philadelphia. It's at the link. It's messy weather. It seemed like something that would, you know, benefit them. And San Francisco goes in there and, and absolutely dominates them, wins that game 42 to 19, a really impressive performance, and one that, you know, when we had Jerry Jones on 105 through the fan this week, and we kind of got a chance to ask him about how he feels about their standing, he thinks, you know, hey, but the way that we're playing, and when you see these two teams on the field, we, we think we're right there in contention with them. Nate, do you think the Cowboys should feel better about where they are in relation to Philadelphia, but more specifically San Francisco, given how they played right now and, and how things have progressed over the last several weeks. To be honest with you, this, this is what I feel, Brother Belt, is the Cowboys should feel good because they've won four in a row. They've overcome adversity. They've played together. They're relatively healthy. Now is your time to shine. Now is the payoff to beat Philadelphia. To do Only reason you lost to Philadelphia last time because you was not mentally sharp. Toe on it a toe on the line, a, a, a route ran too short, yeah. not checking in with the referee. Don't, don't, those are, it was a touchdown, yeah. brother. Yeah. yeah. And all of a sudden, yeah. referee, illegal formation. Big fella, you didn't check in. Yeah, no, you didn't. The refs ain't going to mess that up. So be mentally sharp. Your quarterback played his best game to date. You had 370 yards uh, passing. You had a, a enough run game to offset that. So 
Now what you do is you, you, you get a few turnovers. If our defense can turn them over, give us a short field, and we just run at the right times, because their secondary is right. They like a rotten apple ready You're to right. fall off the, line, right. off the tree, man. I'm just being honest. Yeah. Now, that's just how I feel about it. It ain't because I, what, how we relevant. Because Jim will tell you when, when, when Jim had successful years with Coach Landry, and then we fell off. Then Jimmy came in. He kept the right guys, yeah. the right mixture of veterans and young guys. We didn't play nobody significant. But what helped us is we kept winning. Yep. We started stacking up wins. We started playing through adversity. We started expecting to make the play. That's what happens when you don't play very good teams, which all NFL teams are great. But when you're not a play one of the elite teams in the NFL, the only way you can get better is to play better and play uh, up to your standards. And the Cowboys have played better. I, I, I kind of want to go around the, the table with this. Mick, I'll start with you. When you see a game like that and, and you see how impressive San Francisco is against Philadelphia, there's probably two different ways that you can look at this if you're the Cowboys or if you're just anybody from the outside. You look at it and say, man, this, uh, this says that San Francisco is just as dominant as maybe we, we've thought or feared. Or do you look at it from the side and say, this maybe just says that things are starting to catch up to Philadelphia a little bit. Dallas played them really tough. A lot of people felt like Kansas City and Buffalo played them better, and Philly just kind of escaped with a win. Do you think that this is something that maybe speaks more to, hey, Philadelphia is a little vulnerable, or does it just drive home the point that San Francisco is dominant right I think now? it's a little of both. I mean, San Francisco came in and dominated. They dominated physically, too, uh, even on the sidelines, right, until Big Dom put his hand up, right? Uh, their security director. Uh, <laughs> Controversially but, but put that hand up. <laughs> think about Philadelphia this way. Um, they should have gotten beat uh, by Kansas City. Guys got the touchdown pass yes. on the goal line, yes. and he drops it. That's going to win the game. And in the Buffalo game, in overtime, it's a touchdown pass, and the wide receiver looks one way, and the pass went the other. They could be on a three-game losing streak right now very easily. Uh, so uh, I think they, they are vulnerable, and I think they've been vulnerable. If you look at their scores, they haven't been wiping people out. But as I said, they've been finding ways to win because they make a play when they need to play. You know what the game reminded me of, you guys? It reminded me the Cowboys made plays, right? Everybody made a play to help win that game. And it reminded me of Jimmy going up and down the sidelines clapping his hands in practice going who's going to make the play who's going to make the play and it ingrained in me that okay stats are one thing but it's when you make the plays that count and you're right that's when you make the plays but the hardest thing to do is you don't see it very many repeat champions I feel uh, the only one that Buffalo Bills were abnormally yeah. and we know that but it is hard to get back there just because of the reasons you guys said. I mean, they could play well one year, but those little things, their linebacking core is not very good. No, yeah, that's where they're – And that's why they are. signed Leonard. Yeah, and that's why, because their linebacker core is not as good as they were last year. And those things are affecting them. Now, Hurts is going to make plays. They got two big-time receivers, and we know it, Devontae Smith – and A.J. Brown, I mean, those are guys can play. But they went out and got a new running back. Why? Swift. And they haven't even really played with Sean Penny. That's right. So those things are, it changes the dynamics of it. Now, they're just like, and then when you lose a Super Bowl, it's different than winning the Super Bowl. Trust me. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it is. It's harder. It, it is, is harder. It's harder. Uh, uh, you know, the thing is, uh, it's just hats off to the NFC East. Just a slightly three years ago, we was the NFC. Uh, we wouldn't even have a name for the East. I mean, yeah. they was talking about all of a sudden the East is switched over. Yes. Now we're a dominant force again. This game is the biggest game to date. One coach is telling his players, we're right where we want to be. We're 10-2. We're, we're leading the NFC, and we're leading the NFC East. When the other coaches tell them, hey, fellas, we can throw this thing into disarray. Thanks to the 49ers, it's four teams, Detroit, Philadelphia, uh, the 49ers, and the Dallas Cowboys. We don't know. Now, if the Cowboys win Sunday, now it's like, let's That's see right. who loses first. That's right. Yeah, let's see who loses now. You're right, now. though. You're so, right. So that, 
that's how you got to look at it. This thing is up for grabs, man, if the Cowboys do their job. You, you know, you guys, when, when you were making your run with Dallas in, in the early 90s, like that was the, the class of the NFC was Dallas, San Francisco with Green Bay, you know, coming along and kind yeah. of sniping and, and trying right. to be included in that trio. But that, that was the class of the NFC were those three teams. I'm curious, when you would have a game like if San Francisco and Green Bay were playing each other, is that something you guys would watch with interest? Or, yes. or was it something where you just went, hey, we're going to worry about ourselves? Yeah, we, I would watch because Michael Irvin would be watching. <laughs> and, you know, Mike and they talk did to everything death. Mike yeah, said yeah. to do. By well, the defense, That's obviously idea. we did. <laughs> I don't know what the defense, what y'all did, Jim? What we were looking at is matchups. Yes. Because that's what we always did. Me, Tolbert, and Charles Haley, we always look at the matchups and seeing how we're going to play different players. We look at it and see who matches up with their tackles the best. Right. And then right. that's how we attack them. We might move sides. We might, right. you know, right. Tober might have a better advantage against one right. or I might have advantage, Charles. Right. And we always did that. We looked at matchups, and that's how we played. And we come to each other and talk about them and discuss it and how we're going to attack them. Right. And that's the thing, and that's – you see that a little bit with the Cowboys and how they're moving around is they're looking at the matchups, and Dan Quinn has them doing that and, yeah. and taking advantage of it because you're always going to have somebody. Lance Johnson jumps offside. I mean, he's back in the backfield every time. <laughs> right, right. And we get a couple of those, that's an advantage because yeah. that takes it. They might get a first down, but right. now you're at first and 15. That's right. And they got to take advantage of those things, make him move. Make him make make them make mistakes and us not make mistakes. We are live from the Cowboys Club at the Star in Frisco. This is the SWBC Mortgage Dallas Cowboys Crosstalk at SWBC. Customized solutions for individuals and businesses are just a click away. Visit SWBC to learn SWBC.com to learn more and start your next adventure. When we come back, the Eagles, of course, are in town this weekend. And these two gentlemen here, Jim Jeffcoat and Nate Newton, have had several battles with Philadelphia. They'll share some of their memories of their own experiences with this historic rivalry. That's next on the SWBC Mortgage Cowboys Crosstalk.
back to back, Dallas back, Cowboys back. Crosstalk. Yeah, check this out. Live from the Cowboys Club at the Star in Frisco. Want to use what the pros use? Jack Black is the official men's skincare brand of the Dallas Cowboys. Visit getjackblack.com today. We're back here on Cowboys Crosstalk, live at the Cowboys Club at the Star at Frisco. We're joined by Mickey Spagnola from DallasCowboys.com, Cowboys Mick, legend Mick. Nate Newton, and another Cowboys legend, our special guest this evening, Jim Jeffco. Jim, Jim. So we've got this uh, matchup with the Eagles coming up, and it, it's, you know, at, at different points at different times throughout the history of the Cowboys, there, there's probably been a rotation of who is the rival for, for the team. You know, uh, you know, for a long time it's been Washington at, at different points. Green Bay, probably in the 60s. You go forward, you get San Francisco. The Giants were, were, were a competitive team for them, caused a lot of, uh, you know, sour taste in their mouth at different points. But this team right here, Philadelphia, is probably over the, the length of the Jerry era has probably been the one that has most consistently been tied to as, hey, this is, this is the team that we have our most intense rivalry with. And I know that both of you guys had a lot of, of you know, big experiences with them, both positive and negative towards the growth of this football team. Jim, did you have a lot of, you know, personal hatred for that Eagles uniform, or was it guys on the other side? First of all, the only thing I like about Philly is cheesesteaks, <laughs> <laughs> WWE wrestling, and roller derby. I grew up an hour and 15 minutes away from Philly, and I've never liked Philly. <laughs> I have never liked Philly. And, I mean, just the – and Nader know it, Buddy Ryan, the intensity yeah. there and stuff like that. And what they did, they were um, – it was the end of the game. The, uh, Randall was supposed to kneel, but he throws the bomb for a touchdown. And, you know, that just started. It. And it was before then, but it got worse after that. And that's where you're right. There's been, always been an intense rivalry between the Cowboys and Philly. Obviously, Redskins, New York. But it's something about Philly <clears> – <throat> They always wanted to be us, and they still want to be us. Well, and it's interesting because, you know, it's – I remember, you know, the, the – the, if you look back over the history of Michael Jordan's career, for instance, people will always talk about, man, it was the, it was the Pistons. Like, like, the Celtics may have been the greatest team in that era when, when he was coming up, but it was the Pistons that really, you know, Bad gave boy. him yeah. – yeah, they gave him a lot of trouble. And while San Francisco was the primary rival probably of y'all's era – that was that that Eagles team was one that was really difficult that used to, you know, beat you guys up a little bit. You know, there was the 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 game where Troy got sacked, I think, 11 times. And, and you know, it was always violent interactions, those two teams there. What was the how big was it for you guys when you finally felt like, all right, we have surpassed this team and we've finally kind of put them in our rear view mirror. How big was that for you guys along the way, Nate? Uh, that, that was big because especially that year they got the 11 sacks and then we came back and came, right. K-Mark got the 87-yard yeah. uh, punt return. And then the next year we played Philly and, and Troy, I think we was had them beat, we was beating them, but Troy wanted to just score one more <laughs> touchdown <laughs> just, to, to, just to put the nail in the coffin. I, it, it has never been nice. And I, you know, like I, I'm, I'm with Jim Jeffcoat on that. All I, I wanted from them was a Philly cheese. I wouldn't eat all day <laughs> waiting to go get the Philly cheese. You know, hope nobody don't jump us while we're walking to go get it. Uh, but, you know, it's always been a rivalry, and I hope it's stay a rivalry. That means that both teams are prospering during the year. No question. Because you guys had to get over that Philadelphia hump. Yes. yes. And in 92, right? Yes. And was that the year you ended up beating them in the playoffs in yeah. the first round, too? Did we play them in the playoff that I first round? I think, yeah, it was 92. It was, You're right? You're exactly right. Uh, we beat them in the first round, and that got us over that hump. Yes. But, you know. Because you beat them at the end of the year, yes. and then yeah. you had to play them again. Play them again. Right? Yes. Yes. Wow. And that's when they had to come here, actually. And, yes. And we beat them pretty good now. Yeah. And they had to get over riding the bus into the vet and the eggs being thrown out. <laughs> oh, the man. See, I've only, I've only heard these stories. Every, it when, happened. When, when oh, I, man. No, no, I, I don't doubt Trust it. They, 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 i got to be honest. They, 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 they don't have the same uh, – No, they, they don't. They don't have the same edge well, these in days. The, in the they league. tried to throw ice water yeah. on Jimmy's head. And, beat mean, up Santa thing. Claus. Beat up, yeah. Beat him. snowballs out. Yeah. So, is that – Jim, was that something for both you, Jim, and Nate? Was that something for you guys that I think fans always like to think about? Like their own rivalry oftentimes is with the other fan base or, or, or with the right. uniform itself. And I think sometimes fans wonder like, well, well is that like do, do the players have that same level of intensity towards a specific team or, or is it more business than that? Did you guys have like, like real – like one no negative internal swapping, feelings bro. to them. No. One no jersey <laughs> was swapping. One, the no only question. people that shook hands was the quarterback. That's right. 
Yeah. Other than that, him. I didn't want to shake yeah, nobody man. from Phillies. Yeah. And I knew guys. Yeah, we knew them personally. We were still yeah. doing the offseason. Yep. You know, man, not man, no, homie. No. Was it the guys or the uniforms? Yeah, it, like, like, what was it that? Both, like, like both, I just because they had they had the, they had the uh, muddy waters. Yeah. Nobody Andre liked Waters. Muddy, Andre yeah. Waters. Nobody liked Andre Waters. I mean, shoot, they, yeah. Oh man, nobody knew. Uh, come on, man. His mama didn't even like him. Come on, bro. But he's right. He's right. It was different back then because. There was no love for it. No love, bro. Because the difference is, is now a lot of players are moving around. Yeah. Back then, this is hey, you were my brothers. Yeah. We were, How many years yeah. you played for the Cowboys? Shoot, twelve years. Yeah, I played what, took about eleven years. Yeah. yeah. It wasn't so, no going nowhere, bro. Was, we weren't going anywhere. We were gonna be here. Yeah. So you knew these are the guys that I played with the majority of my career. Did you guys find that the? I, I always find, and, and Mickey, you as well, like the. The discussion there over is, is always, you know, they call it Dallas week. I, I don't feel like necessarily it's always been Philly week. They, they may not have a lot of love loss for Philly, but this, this definitely seems to be a bigger game from the perspective every single year of, of Philly. Philly would, it feels like, would love to go two and – if you told them they can go 15-2 and two and lose two games to the Cowboys or go 2-15 and 15 and beat the Cowboys twice, I feel like that city would prefer to just go 2-15 and 15 and beat Dallas. Right? I, think, I think Philadelphia had an inferiority complex, right? They're not New York. And so they just <laughs> felt right. like they had to do something, right? Yeah. Funny story. You talked about the fans. Uh, Randy White told me a story where the Cowboys went up there and won, and he's in the locker room getting ready to shower, and one of the security guys comes in and tells Randy, hey, I need you to come out in the hallway. Your brother's beating up some guy. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and that was that was Philadelphia. You know, it's the only place I think I've ever gone where there's fights in the stands and they ha- actually hit each other. Right. The other places are oh, you're pushing and shoving. No, these guys are slugging. Yeah. And right? they had a police station in right the, in the vet. The yeah. old vet. The thing, the best thing ever happened to Philly, man. Before they won, they looked too none. Asterisk, well, asterisk Super Bowls <laughs> was the best thing they ever had was Ben Franklin, a statue of Ben Franklin, Rocky. That yep. was the best thing they ever had. <laughs> you know, they finally could take down the Rocky statue and get and put Nick Foles up there. Yeah, they, I mean, they, they could put up a Doug Peterson uh, statue, yeah. and then yeah. two years later, they're like, true. nope, you, you already got to go. Yeah. You got to go, buddy. They, uh, there's no, it doesn't take long for them to turn right there. Right. Now, you know, when you talk about the player changeover, right? Like, like you talk about guys change teams, it makes it a little bit different in this era. You mentioned the name Buddy Ryan a little bit earlier, and that was obviously a guy that there was a lot of animosity. Do you think in this era it makes it a little bit more easy to just say, all right, a representative like, you know, obviously there's a little bit of uh, unsavory feelings towards a guy like Nick Sirianni. Do you think it makes it easier to say, that's our figurehead, that, that, that's who represents the Eagles to us? Nick is nice. He's good. Yeah, Nick is he, 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 a co A player can have a bad play. But they but they'll come to Nick. Nick Nick just got that, that that confidence, that cockiness, that arrogance. The Buddy Ryan, he got that Buddy Ryan about him. You don't know whether he gonna cuss you out like Jimmy or whether he gonna speak nice to you. But you gonna get a response, and that's just that Philly thing, man. He up from Jersey. He, he yeah. got an attitude too. Now he's the nicest yeah. guy in the world. But y'all all up there can turn it on when you want to. But the thing with Seriani is, you want to play against guys like that. Yeah, they motivate you. They motivate you to play better. Because you want to look in their eyes at the end of the game and say, "Yeah, I got you." Yeah, yeah, I got is, you. Is it one of those things of like that's the guy that that you you just despise when he's not with you, but when he's on your side, you yes. you'll do anything for him? Is, yeah. is that the type of guy that you think he is? I wouldn't do anything for him. <laughs> <laughs> <Nate Mike. laughs> See that? That's oh the my God. that's the right that's answer. Right I don't there. like Philly. I have never like. I, I love the energy. We 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 need more of it this week. When we come back, the game of the year for the Cowboys is on deck this Sunday night. Enough looking back at the past and the history. Cowboys Eagles at AT and T Stadium. We'll preview it. That's next on the SWBC Mortgage Cowboys Crosstalk.
back, back to back, Dallas back, Cowboys back, Crosstalk. Yeah, check this out. Live from the Cowboys Club at the Star in Frisco. At SWBC, customized solutions for individuals and businesses are just a click away. Visit SWBC.com to learn more and start your next adventure. We're back here on the SWBC Mortgage Dallas Cowboys Crosstalk, live from the Cowboys Club at the Star in Frisco. I'm Bobby Belt from 105 to the Fan, joined by Mickey Spagnola from DallasCowboys.com, Nate Newton, and former Cowboys legend Jim Jeffcoat, Jeffcoat is our special guest tonight. Yes, yes. And before we get into the specifics of this Eagles and Cowboys game, we did have a pretty significant update uh, from the star today. Uh, the Cowboys sent out the press release saying Dallas Cowboys head coach Mike McCarthy experienced abdominal pain this morning that warranted further evaluation and resulted in a diagnosis of acute appendicitis. He is currently slated for surgery this afternoon, expected to be released later today, and he anticipates coaching on Sunday night. I had a, uh, I, I had my appendix removed years ago and I was uh, I was not going to be standing on a sideline four days later so uh, he's going to tough that out but uh, our, our thoughts are absolutely with coach McCarthy the coordinators kind of ran practice today Mickey I know and uh, you know Dan Quinn spoke to the media and Brian Schottenheimer will talk to them tomorrow this is a little bit of a, a more unique situation than it would have been a couple of years ago when Mike McCarthy missed due to COVID because at the time Mike McCarthy wasn't calling plays he's calling plays now right so so he may feel a little bit like hey I, I really got to be out there and, and ready to call this this is more to cover than it was last time you know I wouldn't put him past him to be here tomorrow sort of like when he he had COVID and remember he was kind of sitting in the golf cart or watching <laughs> out the window yeah. you know I could imagine him doing that uh and as Dan Quinn said today in the press conference, he said, do you think this Irishman's going to miss this yeah, game? From Pittsburgh. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, you know, from a practice standpoint, they've got this whole thing planned out, right? They, the practices are planned out. The game plan's probably planned out. I, I think his presence at practice is not as important as him just kind of knowing what's going on. Um, I don't know. I've seen people have that appendicitis, and, you know, they were good to go in a couple days. Yours didn't burst, did it? No, no. They, they caught it about 12 hours before it did, Mickey. So, yeah, yeah that, that, was, uh, that was a close one. But I also, I, you, you were out. It was like a turnaround. I think I was out the next morning. But I just I wouldn't want to stand on a sideline for three hours. Or have to think about calling yeah, plays. Yeah, I'd like to be the eye in the sky, maybe sit up in the booth, like just have a chair. Yeah, well, you know, he can hours. call the plays he can. from yeah. up in the yeah, press box. That could. is a good point. And he that could be up there to point. get off his feet. That's a long time to be on yeah, your that's, feet. Yeah, that's a very good point that you make. But I think you know, in these days, they've kind of perfected the surgeries, and a lot of times, if they're going in to do something with your intestines, it's like, oh, you don't need the appendix. Let's take it out too. <laughs> it's it's a weird thing that we have that we really don't need I guess uh, and you just hope it doesn't you know get to the point you know one time I, I thought I I had a, an appendix thing going on and the lady checked it out the doctor and she pressed on my side here and I didn't move and she goes oh it's not your appendix because oh, you would have jumped right out of this bed right <laughs> so yeah it, but it's you know what it's it's weird because Today, I, I was writing uh, about how hard it is to sustain winning streaks because there's so many things that can happen, right? You, you're on the road, maybe, your weather, injuries. And then I never thought of a factor of, oh, and your head coach could miss the game. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's just weird. And by the way, the Cowboys' four-game winning streak is tied with the Colts in San Francisco for the longest active winning streak now. Now, there's been longer ones this season, Georgia. but as for active, it's it's four games. Georgia? Georgia. Yeah, oh, that's, that's oh, is seven. that college? Uh, yeah. 29. I, I don't know. All the but wouldn't you be got. more concerned if this was on the road? Yes. yes. I'd be more concerned. That you have to, to travel? Yeah, and he's going to be at home, and he can get the rest. And uh, he can be ready by Sunday, or Sunday night even. That's even better. Well, he is absolutely uh, in our thoughts and prayers. Speedy recovery there for Coach McCarthy. Uh, Jim, this specific game with Philadelphia, Dallas played them really well a couple of weeks ago at the link. And, and this is a Cowboys team that when they've been at home has been absolutely dynamic on offense. They're averaging 41 points a game. They've won 14 games in a row at AT&T Stadium dating back to last year. But like Nate was talking about earlier, it was details last time. It was, okay, route yes. depth. It was, you know, stepping out of bounds on a two-point conversion. It was these little things. 
Is that the biggest factor you think of this game? Is like, hey, the details really need to be cleaned up. Well, obviously they do, and uh, making sure those things because that's two touchdowns they left on the field, but also the defensive penalties. They can't have them because you're playing a team that can take advantage of it with uh, their skilled people. And so that's the thing. They got to make sure that they do not make those defensive penalties. From the offensive standpoint, Nate will talk about that, but they got to be ready. You know, just like Mickey said, Hassan Riddick's going to come out. He's just yeah. licking his chops. And they got those two big Georgia dudes inside. Yes, yeah, he's bigger than Georgia. Up. Georgia. <laughs> yeah, they shows up. <laughs> Jalen <laughs> Carter. I mean, yeah. they, I mean, they got men in Jeff there. Jeff Davis, so. uh, Jordan Davis, yeah. uh, Fletcher Cox is 12th year. Yeah. You, know, got, you know, got his second sack of the season last week. Uh, yeah. So he got 2.5 between Davis and um, the other kid, uh, Carter. Carter. They got seven sacks. I mean. Uh, Hassan got nine and a half, and Sweat exactly. got six point so, five. But yeah. saying all that, McCaffrey ran all over him. You know, I. I but went, how did that they, they? The one thing you got to remember about what Shanahan's doing, he's listening to his dad. They're running Denver's offense. Uh -huh. They're running that zoned offense, and that's what it, the short passes, and they're making it. One of them should have been a holding call uh -huh. on uh, one of the receivers. But what they do is they give you a look, and that's not what is what you wanted. You think yeah. you know it. You never know it. And where did they run? Uh, they didn't really run inside. They ran right outside the guard. That's right. Right outside the Kind tackles. of the edges. Right? Yeah, edges. They, they, that's they, what I'm saying. And I was telling people earlier today, what you have to do to attack them is you got to make Jordan Davis, Fletcher Cox, and Jalen Carter run. go lateral. You yeah. got to make them dudes turn their shoulders. Yeah, and now that's you what get Denver seams. did. Yeah, you can get seams. And the uh, defense, you saw they throw that little screen to uh, Samuel. Debo. And he came, Debo, and, it's, and it looked like he was running up the middle. Yeah. But he came from the side. He was making these guys move. Exactly. That's what this, I'm telling you, he learned from the Super Bowl. Yep. Coach Shanahan learned from the Super Bowl. He said, never again. Mm -hmm. Give me my quarterback, and which is that little Brock Purdy. Yeah. He got, he got his man. We talk about, you know, their, how, how good they've been at home as a team, but specifically in offense. Nate, what is what, – what can explain something like that? I mean, I mean, that's not just fluky when you look at that run and the way they score points at home. Is that just you think this is a team that's faster on turf? Is this a, a crowd impact? What, what do you think is the All explanation for how good they are at home? All of it. And, but more importantly, execution. Paying attention to the details. Uh, having a game plan and, 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 and being able to execute it. The fans will give you grace and mercy. But when you do something great, they're just looking for that little small thing now. And they fired you up. Four years ago, we did not have this type of no, uh, no. intensity and energy from our fans. Now, exactly. since the Coach McCarthy, these fans are loving it. They are feeling, you're seeing more and more Cowboy fans each game. Uh, but before, you, was, you may see a, a, a couple of thousand Philly fans. You don't see that anymore. You may see half the thing filled true. with the 49ers fan. You don't <laughs> see that no more. People are holding on to their tickets because they feel something special is about to happen. Yeah, absolutely. And, and this is, again, a game that's on primetime television. It, it's Sunday night football. Biggest game of the year to this point for the Cowboys. A chance to tie for the division lead. Obviously, there are tiebreakers involved right. that need to be played out. But this would be a tie of first place in the NFC East for them. But also what might be on the line here is the Jalen Hurts, Dak Prescott discussion of MVP, which these are two of the three biggest names going right now. It's Purdy, Hurts, and Dak Prescott. Jim, when you look at this game and knowing what a big primetime game it is, a divisional game, do you look at this and say the MVP might be on the line in this game? Oh, no question about it. No question. Hey, in a game like this, hey, the stars shine bright at night. That's <laughs> when that's true yeah. because that's when the big time players come out, and that's when hey, you come to play, and you notice the teams that are successful, they love this spotlight. You know, you're gonna see the best out of the best players. Do you guys like win, it? Whoever win this game. Dak don't have to play great, but if he win this game and with the star backing him, oh that, yeah, that, that, that's what I tell you. The Cowboys, this star does oh, back yeah. him. Yeah. So all he do is win the game. The other kid has to shine to get MVP. Dak just win the game. He can get MVP. And uh, quickly going around the table here before we wrap up, uh, thoughts on the game, Jim? You think this is one the Cowboys pull out? I do. I do. I think they will win it, and they'll win it convincingly. People are going to be shocked at how well they play because they'll be ready, and they're at home. They're in the, the just like Nate said. This is a crowd that helps them now, 
and they are loud, they're going to be, hey, they're going to be in a bad mood. <laughs> so, <laughs> Nate, yeah. uh, Cowboys uh, pick here? Uh, yeah, as long as we win it by one, just win the game. Be who you've been being. Win the game. If it's by 40, if it's by one, it don't matter. Win this game. Play smart. You know, the one thing I've noticed with this crowd and when they're at home, if they can get off and get a lead, it's very hard for teams to play catch up against this defense, mm -hmm. right? And if you've noticed, uh, with the exception of the Seattle game, although they did get yeah. off okay and mm -hmm. then it fell apart, they get off to a lead, which I never understand why when they win the toss, they don't take the ball, or when the other team wins the toss and they defer and give the Cowboys the ball, where after one possession, chances are you're behind. Yes. And when this team's got the lead, that's when they start crushing people, I think. Absolutely. This will be a, a, a high-stakes game for the Cowboys on Sunday Night Football, not just for them as a team, but like we just said, for Dak Prescott, for your quarterback, and everything else. Uh, thank you so much to those of you who joined us tonight for Cowboys Crosstalk. We have been live here from the Cowboys Club, the Star in Frisco. Mickey Spagnuolo from DallasCowboys.com, Nate Noon, and, and Jim Jeffco. Thank, thank you, you so thank much you. for joining much. us today. Uh, anything really quickly here in the last 30 seconds you want to shout out where people Go can find Go Cowboys. Go uh, Cowboys. And, and uh, I'm on a J&B talking shop on YouTube. Perfect. <laughs> J&B, baby. There you go. You can hear more of the just – uh, innate hatred for the city of Philadelphia from yeah. Jim Jeffcoat <laughs> there on his YouTube channel. Uh, I'm Bobby Belt from 105.3 The Fan. Thank you so much for joining us, Cowboys and the Eagles, this Sunday night on NBC. This has been a production of DallasCowboys.com and the Dallas Cowboys Football Club. How about this, Cowboys? Yeah!